we are myth vision everybody in the chat i know you're showing up for the funeral you don't have to wear black it's okay and it's not going to be really a depressing day it might actually be exciting for many of you who are tuning in to the death of apologetics i have special guests joining us today you saw the hitmen on the thumbnail just to show you again my wonderful art that i have creatively put together so you can enjoy front row seats to uh the gladiator ring on ideas and that is dr joshua bowen and kip davis how are you gentlemen doing <laughs> dr kill hey guys dr. kill how you doing it's a great picture i know right this is uh <laughs> this is the uh the serious office look yes no doubt no yeah. doubt it <laughs> is so um welcome I'm going to tune a little. I got to do like church here. Remember now we're at a funeral. I'm going to play a little and bit of that emotional, okay. emotional intro music. Right. And mm -hmm. um, we're going to have that music playing while I introduce people to something that I think is important. Here we go. Okay. Music is playing. It takes a second, but it's growing. It's growing upon you. You could feel the calling. You could feel it tingling. Okay. Here we go. So number one, Dr. Joshua Bowen just launched Part two, I repeat, The Atheist Handbook to the Old Testament, volume two. And it goes deeper and harder, not saying the first one wasn't good, but once you get criticisms, once your, your feet are in the game and you, and you see what's coming at you, you know what you need to address even deeper and going into these arguments. So he has not only himself, but a plethora of academics behind him on what is being discussed in here. Make sure you go get a copy. Let me drop this right now in the chat for those of you who are saying, amen, hallelujah, how can I tithe? You know how you can tithe? <laughs> you can get the book and it grants you salvation. You don't have to work for it. This is a fact. This is a fact, guys. Don't laugh at the truth. You may be, if you do, you might be blaspheming the Holy Ghost, okay? And we don't want that to happen here. So on a serious note, part two, get you a copy right now ebook hard copy whatever i said if you want the hard copy because it's like you could throw it at someone and legit use it as a weapon and they're heavy true. man this is beautiful books too i i appreciate everybody in the chat seriously love you thank you for supporting us and trying to give freedom freedom to people's thoughts freedom to people's lives to let them be who they are and not controlled by ideology that might be bronze age it's or, especially useful in, in states that don't have conceal and carry laws, right? <laughs> exactly. There's a loophole. This book does shoot bullets, but I'm gonna I'm not gonna tell you how to do that on, on camera. You can join my group here. And I, we're getting there. We're getting there. So you can go to digitalhammurabi.com. I was just looking it up, and uh, you can get the book that way. And uh, other books he's written, Volume One. If you're behind the scenes, don't worry. We're not gonna judge you. You know, the altar's still there. It's not going anywhere. You can come down to the altar and buy the book. Um, he has a YouTube channel. Really, it's ran by the minds behind Digital Hammurabi, which is his yes. beautiful Megan. And she is on top of this. Mm -hmm. Also, Kip Davis has a YouTube channel. And I brought it up in a video. I just did responding to William Lane Craig, where you're talking about, I messed up and said Lee Strobel, but McDowell, and both of them do the same thing. They create their own gospel and sell it to Christians who love to hear it. Anyway, make sure you subscribe to both scholars. Those links are in the description. And to be fair, since I already plugged your book, I got to plug Kip's uh, YouTube channel. We got to get some subscribers over there. Hell yeah. It's not been very active for a little while. Yeah. But that's that's going to change soon. And don't worry, everybody, if you're like, this guy is not shutting up. I promise you, I won't be talking much longer. They will be doing a lot of the talking. You can super chat your questions, of course, and we'll try to address them on the way. I'm working my you-know-what off, trying to get my house right to move and still create content and keep Myth Vision alive. In fact, I broke off to come do this in the middle of painting the kitchen. We finished the kitchen, actually, so I just put the hardware onto the cabinets, etc. Yeah. Nice. Um Dr. Josh, I think there's probably 60 or 70, I'm not exaggerating, videos that we did. Hmm. Two times I've traveled to you in person that are still on Patreon and they haven't found their way on YouTube. They will one day, but if you want access to all of those videos, go to my Patreon. You can join as little as $3 a month. It helps MythVision do what we're doing. All right, enough about me. 
And let me turn that music off because I know so many people got saved just now from this. <laughs> <laughs> you can feel it. I mean, just, uh, so yeah. you you brought it to my attention. I, like someone might go, Derek, you titled this "The Death of uh, Christian Apologetics." Whoa, you got a a bone to pick with Christian apologetics, and sure, I do have a problem with it. But it was actually you guys, uh, scholars, who said, "Look, title it this because we're really going in and seeing a lot of problems." Where do we want to begin in this conversation? Should I read the blurb about this book, Dr. Kill, and then? Let's start there, yeah. Okay. So, teasing everybody, Dr. Joshua Bowen has not seen this yet. I have. I feel privileged. Uh, I'm an elect one, of course, chosen. Poor Dr. Josh. Maybe he'll come along. Who knows? Uh, Dr. Kill, Dr. Kip Davis, wrote this. And I'm going to have to turn the banner off for a second. Christian apologetics is a billion-dollar industry the effects of which have gained a pronounced foothold on YouTube and other social media platforms. A seriologist and Bible or biblical scholar, Josh Bowen, clearly understands that this economic engine is fueled almost entirely by the continued existence, usage, and abuse of the Bible in modern Western culture. In this second offering of his provocative series, Bowen effectively, carefully, and accurately not only teaches the Bible, but has provided an exceptionally applicable tool for anyone's arsenal to confront the forces of fundamentalism, other forms of religious oppression, and the general absurdity of pseudo-scholarly attempts to whitewash and appropriate the arcane texts and traditions of the ancient world in the name of God. Damn. Dude. <laughs> wow. You might have them put that blurb in the book now. No, I was just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. Well, uh, I'm very, very humbled. Uh, thank you. And for anybody that doesn't know, um, you know, we kind of got, and you guys I'm sure will remember this, we kind of got poo-pooed. I kind of got poo-pooed with the first volume. Uh, because it was like, oh, does this thing even go undergo peer review? And I guess nobody read the back of the book to see like Joel Baden and Francesca Stavrakopoulou, amongst other people that read through uh, some of the chapters. But Megan and I to were very fair, intentional. Hmm? To be fair, I th that was that was coming from like one source, wasn't it? Um, it feels like it's picked up because people are asking about it on Twitter now. Like, does anybody actually in academia uh, respect anything that Josh says? I mean, like, have they read the back of the book? You don't even have to read the book to know this anyway. anyway. Well, I mean, so what we do and we did it with much more intentionality in volume two is we're trying to find experts in the field that will be very critical and do serious peer review on specific parts of the book. And of course they can read the whole thing if they like. But so for example, we got Eric Klein and we asked Eric Klein to read through in detail, uh, the chapter on the Exodus myth or history, and, uh, also on the conquest under Joshua. And because that's, you know, that's part of his specialization. Uh, if anybody doesn't know, Eric Klein wrote the uh, incredibly popular 1177, which I highly recommend everybody to read. Um, but like uh, we got Kenneth Atkinson uh, also to read specifically the, the uh, chapter on the conquest. Of course, he went through and as he does, read the whole thing and gave substantive notes. Um, but I think what's What's really nice, I mean, we had Egyptologists reading it, we had other biblical scholars reading it, um, but I felt very fortunate that Kip agreed to be the general editor of the book, and I wasn't expecting him to do what he did. Um, I was really just expecting him to kind of, you know, go through it and kind of say, hey, I might, you might want to reword this a little this way. He added so much substance to the chapters um and it was it wasn't even a question of should i incorporate these uh it, I, I can think of very few times that i thought mm, maybe maybe that would be you know a little too much here or something um so i am eternally grateful 
uh, to Kip for working his magic with the book. Thank you. And thank you for that blurb. That's too kind. It's my pleasure. Mm. My I'm pleasure. curious because I haven't read the book yet. I have been speaking to Dr. Ronald Hindle in email and that didn't work out with me trying to move. I probably didn't harass him enough, but uh, cause he's a busy guy. Um, but we've been talking to these academics for a while and that's been what myth vision. In fact, we've been encouraged, motivated by your channel. When I finally met you, Dr. Josh, your channel was about good scholarship. You guys have mm -hmm. a slogan. How's that slogan go again? Um, always ask, uh, resist poor scholarship. Always ask, how do you know that? Yeah. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to try and get good scholarship and continue on the path of educating. The more you find out good scholarship, the more you realize something interesting. And this is what I wanted to say and then allow you to go into the book. I'd love to get into some details. Let's appetite or give people an appetizer, so to speak, if that makes sense. Um, the more academics that are serious in fields I, I've been learning from, the more I find even Christians in the field. And I go, hmm, this is weird. You're literally saying what my atheist friends are saying about this, but you've drawn a conclusion I don't draw, and I don't see the reason why I would need to, but you believe. And I'm like, why are they looking so much different than apologist and their arguments are right in line with the atheist yeah. that are being skeptical and saying this is what it looks like it walks like a duck talks like a duck this is what it seems like but they draw a conclusion saying yeah i'm a christian and mm -hmm. it was really weird because i thought when i was going to get into serious academia at, when, at first a few years ago that i was only going to encounter a bunch of skeptic atheists and it was going to be all these people who like you know are on the same ontology as i am in terms of conclusions and it was like no and they say amen with the things I'm saying with them more than they do with apologists. They think that they're really ax grinding, um, trying to save face and pr pretend, if you will. So I, I really want to hear uh, what Kip's experience has been. But I, I, I tell this story periodically, um, and I'd like to know if Kip has experienced something like this. Um, when I first got on YouTube, uh, there was a gentleman by the name of Mike Winger who had a video out or a video series out, can't remember, on Ezekiel chapter 26 and the prophecy against Tyre. And as we started to put out videos, I, I kind of got bombarded with requests like, hey, could you look at this video series on the book of Daniel. I've had family members send me Mike Winger's videos on the book of Daniel. So I got to give it to him. Like he's out there, right? Everybody knows who he is. Um, and I remember I, I, I watched his video series and I prepared like a short little paper in response and then prepped to do a video. And I went to uh, the ASOR meeting, the American Society of Oriental Research, uh, and it was in Denver, I think. So it was like 2018, maybe. And uh, I met up with one of my evangelical friends. I was, you know, connected at the hip to him at Hopkins, uh, and he's out at Tyndale now. And I remember sitting down, having a cup of coffee with him, and he, we were catching up, and he said, so like, what, what's going on with your YouTube channel? And I said, yeah, it's weird. I'm I'm uh, putting together this response about Ezekiel 26 and the prophecy against Tyre. And he said, oh, what about it? And I said, well, like showing that Nebuchadnezzar didn't take Tyre and it was sort of a failed prophecy. And he said, why, why would you make a video on that? I was like, yeah, I, I, I don't know. Like, <laughs> this, is, a this is a thing. Yeah, yeah, I mean, he was like, yeah, of course it didn't. Like. Of course it didn't. Why, what, what's the argument? Why Why would you even do that? You know, it was sort of like, does, uh, you know, Malach mean king in Hebrew? I'm, you know, I'm making an argument about that. Why? Um, and so I've, I've noticed that, um, you know, there were so many professors uh, in our department at Hopkins that identified as Christian, right? And, and it, I took like we we translated through the entirety of the book of Ezekiel in one of the one of the Ezekiel classes um, or in the Ezekiel class and discussed it in detail over the entirety of the semester. 
And not once was there like hands being raised and saying, how do you address this? It's, what? No, why, why would this even be an issue? Um, and yet the people that are teaching the class, uh, you know, identify as Christians. So it's it's not like, the, it's like people are always still amazed. I'll shut up. But people are always still amazed uh, that Megan, my wife, is a Christian, mm -hmm. right? And it's like, well, wait a minute. How can how can that be the case? Because she doesn't, you know, see the Bible as inerrant and and divinely inspired uh, in that in that same you know uh, type of inspiration. Yeah, because that's not required. So I I I feel you, Derek. Like <clears throat> uh, it doesn't. <laughs> if you're a Christian, that doesn't mean that you have to hold to bad arguments. That's a good point. Kip, yep. did you want to? Uh, yeah, I have a, I have a few things uh, to say about that. Um, you know, as somebody who worked in the academy and as somebody who's worked at, um, you know, a, a private uh, a Christian university, um, the thing that, uh, and this is something like I identified even long before I started to question my own faith commitments. Um, but already at like the early on in my, in my graduate education, I came to understand that apologetics is not a friend of academics. And within my, uh, you know, I think quite conservative um, Christian biblical studies program that I was in, my, my teachers, uh, my instructors were all rolling their eyes just as hard as the skeptics at Christian apologetics. You know, there's a reason why you can't go to any, you know, credible university on the planet to enter an apologetics program. You can only enter an apologetics program at, uh, you know, at like uh, uh, a seminary or a, a, a Christian diploma mill. And uh, I think the alarming thing about it and I, I sort of resonate when when Josh was was sharing his friend's response like why would you make why would you make a video response about that like something so stupid my immediate reaction is the reason you make video responses to that is because Mike Winger has like a hundred thousand viewers yep way more than that he's got like three four hundred thousand it's like it, it's you know I, that tells you everything you need yeah. to know about why this kind of stuff needs to be done and i think in, in particular on this medium because because you know nerdy biblical scholars are uh not historically the most technologically adept group <laughs> um or on the cutting edge of uh of of social trends in popular culture and for that reason i mean thank god that's you know that's that's shifted quite a bit over the past uh 15 years or so um but you know this stuff happens out in the oh yeah and, and it even sounds weird saying that this stuff happens out where where most people are consuming this material and within the academy nobody knows it yeah. Or recognizes it and goes like what the like yeah. what the hell it, it, why it, and these the reason apologetics survives and thrives is because of kind of this this tunnel medium now that we have um you know on social media and within within youtube where you can completely insulate yourself with these pseudo intellectuals um and never ever uh take a step into into actual uh actual scholarship and and this is 
I mean, this is really what was behind the blurb that I wrote. This is why I think Josh's books are as important as they are. Like, you know, uh, Josh is probably uh, not going to be surprised that his book is not the most academically rigorous volume that I've ever read. Right. Um, you know, he's not writing it and, for academics, you know, exactly. Yeah. And it, you know, if I have, uh, I, it, some of my criticism of him, I, I think when I was, when I was reviewing and editing the book was it almost felt like he was, there were times it almost felt like he was being too apologetic for it. Like it, <laughs> it sounded like he was repeating himself an awful lot. And I think that came from a place of just, you know, waving his hands and going, you know, I'm not doing anything new. I'm just, I'm just informing the general public yeah. about what scholars are talking about. Hmm. And I, I just want to you know, show people the book because some people are just now tuning in, you know. So, so the uh, I, I mean the 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 fact of the matter is more people are probably going to encounter and read this book than you know most books written by scholars because i, I don't think Bingo. you know I, in in my experience scholars the the scholars that that i've dealt with care about their students they care about what's going on in their in in their universities they care what's going on within scholarship they're not all that interested in, you know, what's taking place in, in, you know, in, in popular conversations about these topics around kitchen tables or on YouTube. So there's still very much, I, I mean, I think it's getting better, but there still really is this, this, this separation between these two worlds. And uh, Josh's work is, is really good at uh at attempting to bridge that and yours too i mean it's it's fantastic um well the amount of the amount of scholarship the 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 number of scholars and how you've you've prioritized um you know getting scholars into oh, yeah, into yeah, your yeah. studio well, thank you or, or onto onto your videos just the fact that you get them oh i mean hard you know what i'm talking about you know <laughs> but but I mean like that it's so important because as you know as Kip was saying, it's very difficult to be the tip of the spear and the handle, right? It's very very difficult, and so like these people that are out there in research institutions that are trying to translate through those sixty tablets that are in their corpus and trying to make a score of the Sumerian and to to you know then to to present this in such a way that all their other colleagues at Harvard and Yale and, you know, that, that won't pick them apart and destroy them because they made a little mistake here. It's really hard to be that focused and to try to say something new with their research. And at the same time, provide all that background, foundational, easy to understand and digest material for the interested non-specialist. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, you only have so many hours in a day. And so, Derek, what you do and what I'm trying to do in the book is, is it's like gathering up the t all those different spear tips and saying, let me, let me borrow you for 10 minutes, right? Let me distill down your work into some bite-sized portions and present them with all this background information that you don't have the time, mm -hmm. uh, probably, or the inclination uh, to, to go into. Because I would imagine that, and I've said this a couple of times, and Kip, I know you've thought it if you haven't said it. Um, when you say to people, like, well, that, that Hebrew word, just because it means it here, doesn't mean that it means it there. And when they say, well, how do you know that? I, I've responded, I don't have two years to teach you that, right? <laughs> I just don't, right? If you're going to pay me and hire me, you know, to, uh, to teach you Hebrew, fine. But I don't have the time to give you uh, a first and second year Hebrew grammar class. Sorry. And, and that has to be uh, part of this and factoring this in as saying, look, they don't have time or the inclination to teach 
apologists who want to come at them with, well, isn't it possible that, isn't it possible that, isn't it possible that, no, bitch. You know? your, your, um, your, your camera got stuck like the it, perfect that time. That was awesome, <laughs> wasn't it? Oh, <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, you're right. No, you're right. I Look, I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer at all, but I do try to chew the very dense topics of academics and kind of make them popular. That is what MythVision's trying to do, is take the stuff that's hiding behind $60,000, $100,000 academic research and go into college and spending all this time and all these years and going ahead and saying, look, we aren't going to take that path with you. We're not going to go eight years with you here. We're going to draw. just give us your conclusions. Give us what you discovered. And then I get the next person who spent 20 years of their life doing this stuff. Give us your conclusions. And then at least it might pique the curiosity of people to go, why are these really brilliant people yeah. coming on and actually totally opposing everything yes. these yeah. other supposed brilliant apologetic people are saying? And why does it keep heading in that direction? Everything's yeah. starting to head in that direction that even those I, I'm caught off guard thinking everybody's a skeptic, you know, then I talked to him and like, yeah, 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 I'm an Anglican. You're what? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm a believer. Like Ian Mills, New Testament studies, or recently I just did James F. McGrath. We talked about the deity and Christology and stuff. And I'm like, you're a believer. <laughs> and they're like, yeah, 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 I believe. But I'm not an apologist in any way. You know, Delcy Allison Jr. He's like, I know the apologist and all that. Yeah, but I, it's a faith thing. I had an experience in 1970 something, and I'm like, thank you for your honesty. I respect yeah. that. Yeah. People have amazing experiences and they change us profoundly. And I'm not here to bash that. I have my reasons of why I think we have them and I take a natural approach. But if that's your approach and you're not out here going, here's my book. And I'm going to show you why this should smack you in the head and you need to bend down or you're going to be cooking in God's mm. breath for all eternity. You know, anyway. you know, Christian Christian apologetics is a lot like um, Christian contemporary music. Um, it's very ghetto. The uh, Christian Christian contemporary. Well, at least I, I, I haven't been paying too much attention in a while, um, but like when I was a when I was a teenager, I was not allowed to listen to the rock bands because you know it was it was it was Satan's music. <laughs> so you know, I uh, my brother and I we 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 picked up on on the greats like uh, like Petra and Barnabas and Daniel Band and of course Striper. Um, and, uh, you know, the reason I, the reason for this was because I just wasn't allowed to listen to, you know, popular music, to secular, uh, rock music. But, you know, my, my parents allowed me to listen to this because it had positive messages about, about Jesus and, and, and Christianity. And we would go to concerts and they would, at every single Christian rock concert I've been to, you know, there is a testimony and there is an altar call. And in interviews, Christian uh, singers talked on and on and on about how the mission was to you know save lost souls and to evangelize the world and yet you know you can only buy christian music and christian music and bookstores and the 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 people who attended these christian rock concerts were just like me they were you know christians who weren't allowed to listen to worldly music it's very ghetto with this veneer on it like we're doing this for the kingdom but in actual fact this is all about just making christians feel better about being christians this is what christian apologetics is it you know i it doesn't i'm i'm not convinced in the slightest that there's ever been somebody who's come to faith because they read josh mcdowell's uh, case uh, or more than a carpenter and went, wow. 
he makes a great intellectual case for this. Mm. You know, very much like Christian music is all just for Christians, Christian apologetics is all about making Christians feel better about the intellectual merits of their faith convictions. I just did, by the way, it's going to be on Patreon as soon as we're done with this live, um, a response that Paul Agia did to William Lane Craig's almost unbelievable admission. Mm. The level he admitted to this was beyond any other admission I've heard before. He literally used uh, the phrase where in, in the middle of it where he's like, well, if I thought, you know how he talks, really yeah. grabs you with his emotions and stuff. I thought this message is so great that if there's one if there's a chance, one in a million chance that this is true, that I would believe, uh, and, and sure enough, he does. And I had to incorporate this here. Not good like one out of a hundred? I'd say more like one out of a million. So you're telling me there's a chance. Yeah! <laughs> you know, it's it's funny that it, it, I feel like that's a really good segue, even though I'm sure it wasn't intentional, to um, really the way that I've, I structured volume two. Um, because I went to uh, the, the better conference uh, that the Atheist Network Group put on in July. Um, no, June, June, because it's July now. It was June. Um, it's barely, it's barely yeah. July. <laughs> um, and the, the speech that I gave was talking about how we can have better conversations specifically with Christian apologists, uh, and fundamentalists. Um, and oftentimes there's an overlap there. Um, and one of the things that I sort of, my, my speech sort of, my presentation centered on was dealing with this, isn't it possible that response? And I feel like in some ways, atheists and skeptics and agnostics, whatever, fall into the trap of trying to prove what it is that they're saying. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, Bart Ehrman always talks about uh, Judas and did Judas hang himself or did he fall down and burst asunder? Uh, you know, like my KJV there, um, burst asunder. Uh, and, and people, you hear it all the time, right? And he talks about it. Isn't it possible that, that Judas like hung himself and then and then as he was dying, like he, they slid the branch broke or something. He was over a cliff and he fell down and he, isn't that possible? Well, yeah, I mean, that's possible. Well, that's it. That's all I need. Mm -hmm. Right. We're all done. And the reason that that's so effective for a Christian apologist, um, is that they're starting from a conclusion yep. and the conclusion is we know for sure that this is the word of God, it is inspired, it is inerrant, um, <clears throat> and that my God is the right God, obviously. Uh, and so when you start there, you know that it has to be true. Yes. You know that it has to be historically uh, reliable. And so any possibility that works, and, and Kip actually had a, a, a word change, like a, 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 you, you phrased it, you modified my phraseology, and I can't remember what it was. Um, but it was like, I had something like any remote possibility and you made it so much stronger. Um, but I can't remember what you used. So buy the book to see what he wrote, I'm just kidding. but I'm half kidding. No, there is but. no kidding. I'm, I mean, look, I legit, there is no hiding what I do here. I, I do this for a living. I do this full time. It's a passion of mine, especially from my own experience. I used to work at a rehab. I was a recovering drug addict. And when I got like five years clean, I worked for rehab. Um, you know, they cross over my experience and my working and doing what I'm passionate about is important. And this book, especially when I read number one, I was like, okay, 
this is solid, especially when you go through the history of the ancient Near East and Assyria getting into Babylonian stuff, the context that's going on. I'm like, okay, we need more of this. How often do we hear even today from apologists saying, um, the ancient Near Eastern was different. Uh, they had a totally different understanding of all this stuff. And it's always special pleading. And let's let's be fair, like like the better, right? Better conversations. Let's be fair. My video response is actually about what you just said, Dr. Josh. So it's like you read my mind. It's Maybe there is a higher power. Um, but it made me really think about this. W when we have that experience, I suspect that you, me, and Kip all had some religious experience. We, we attributed to God or Jesus or whatever in our youth at some point in our life. And we, that is what gave us that, um, that bias of this is true. I know it. I had a per, how do you explain that experience? Yeah. yeah. Therefore I'm going to search the world. And I, I equated it to like a handbag with, um, whole patches, like super glue, like all these tools that they hand you and they go, this is the truth. And if you find any problems, here's your handy dandy, you know, fixer patch thing because you know you can rely on that experience at the end of the day to be what really gets you through and every single debate almost that i've watched of william lane craig at some point he goes and we have the witness of the holy spirit and the assurance what are you talking about what do you really mean yeah. so i think it boils down to my experience is true and what i'm saying about that experience and then you're going out of your way to prove it yep yeah that's totally it you know, it's even gotten to the point. Uh, um, I've marveled at this a little bit more recently. Um, I was watching uh, a Mike a Mike Winger video a couple weeks ago, and I think I I, I think we we uh, it's one that that the three of us were just sort of chatting about in conversation together yeah. um, over not Twitter because. Because I don't subscribe, um, but uh, it's it's at the point where did you? Sorry, that's my that's my <laughs> Alexa talking back at me. Oh, shut up, Alexa! Oh, um, so it's to the point where there's such a strong pre-commitment to the truth of Scripture that when winger encounters something that on the face of it within the bible sounds absurd his response is not to go well that's weird i wonder why it says that his response is to go that can't possibly be what it means because how dumb does that sound and that's pretty much and that is pretty much the extent of this argument is that we we can't take the Bible on face value on this point because boy that would sound pretty dumb. So, so <laughs> like <laughs> this is what recently happened with a couple other videos that I've shared with you, but specifically Mike Winger went above and beyond. Yeah, but we like this. This shows up, I think. It, and it's it's not just somebody like Mike Winger that does. I mean, you, you see academics, um, like evangelical academics, conservative academics, yeah. that are bringing this this confirmation bias to the table. And uh, I talk about it in. So maybe maybe what I could do real quick is just. I, I know you wanted me to like say what's in the book. Yes. Um, so the first three chapters are the background chapters. Uh, chapter one just tells the story. It continues to tell the story of the Old Testament. It starts with Joshua and the conquest, and it ends with uh, the death of Solomon um, and Rehoboam taking over and getting ready to have the divided kingdom. Uh, chapter two, and it just tells the story. It doesn't add any extraneous things. It's just for the narrative. Um, chapter two is the history of the ancient Near East, and the, in the first book, we did it from the Mesopotamian perspective because we have a lot more information from the Mesopotamian perspective, many more sources. 
Uh, this time it's from the Egyptian perspective and it's not nearly as thorough one because it's not my wheelhouse uh, at all. Uh, but I had several Egyptologists read it after it was done to make sure it was okay and got the thumbs up. So, um, and again, I wasn't saying anything groundbreaking, um, but it, it explains uh, a lot of Egyptian history as it pertains to uh, their interactions with Canaan uh, or Israel later. Chapter three then is the archaeology chapter, and that's where I think it starts to get uh, interesting in the context of this stream. So it's about the conquest and is there archaeological evidence to support the conquest under Joshua? <clears throat> um, right. Uh, so we we go through that in some detail. Can I ask you about that chapter real quick? Just please. Um, I read recently the Bible unearthed with Finkelstein, and I was just and on Audible because I'm working uh, on the house. And that first of all is heavy. I mean, it's a it's a lot. If you're not un, like if you're not immersed in archaeology or understanding locations and regions and dates, this is going to be a, a lot to take in. But my question is: is in that chapter do you really dive into some of this that is clearly anachronistic or really showing that the editors and all this kind of stuff are you getting are you poking holes in the narrative yeah so let me answer it this way um that problem that a lot of people face with like archaeological terminology uh is something that i specifically deal with in the first volume so the archaeology chapter in the first volume just goes through what is archaeology, how does it work, what are the terms that are used, how do they actually do it. So that should prep you for this archaeology chapter. Um, and basically what we're doing in the chapter is asking two questions. Um, so there are certain sites in the Negev, in Transjordan, in Cisjordan, that the narrative in like numbers and obviously in the book of Joshua say these cities were destroyed, right? Some of them like burned to the ground. Um, and Eric Klein back in the mid two thousands, I think wrote a book where he used this methodology to look at eight cities. Uh, I think it was eight that are in Cisjordan to say the text says the biblical text says that these were all destroyed. Uh, were there, is there evidence that this city was destroyed at that time? So what I do in the chapters, I ask two questions um, of cities that are in outside of outside of uh, Canaan proper and inside of Canaan proper. Um, was there occupation at that site? Were there people there? Was there a city there at the time? Um, and two, does it show evidence of being destroyed? So we go through seven different cities, three outside of Cisjordan and then four inside of Cisjordan, including Jericho and I. Um, so the cities are Arad, Heshbon, Debon, Jericho, I, uh, Lachish, and Hatzor. And we go through them in enough detail. Uh, it's not overwhelming detail, I don't think, but enough detail that you have a very solid footing uh, on which to say, yeah, this just doesn't make sense. What you see time and time and time again, with very few exceptions, is during the late Bronze Age, the time when the Exodus and conquest are supposed to have taken place, there's either no city there and hadn't been a city there for like sometimes a thousand years, um, or there's just minimal like village level occupation at the site. And like the destruction layers, they're all at different times. If there is a destruction, it's at a different time during the late Bronze Age. In other words, it's not all at the same time when you would need it to be. Right, right. Um, so that's that's what we do in the chapter. And it's specifically to say, does this work as a historically reliable document, right? It doesn't say what's the correct position to take. It's just saying, this is why all the scholars that do this say no. Uh, it's not that. Wow. Yeah, um, I love that. I'd love that. I'd love to get into further chapters. I just want to mention, I love how some of this stuff, we have absolute evidence from ground archaeology, the whole nine, to know nothing happened there till the seventh century. So we have we have places the Bible saying things happened in the 13th century and then this time, and we know nothing happened there based on evidence, like 
what is it? Absent of evidence is evidence of absence. So if you don't have it there, then nothing, we shouldn't make this conclusion that, well, uh, God sent down the angels with vacuum cleaners after that happened. And then 500 years later, that's when it actually happens. Um, I just find that stuff fun. Well, tell us yeah. more about the chapter. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so just like this is one of the problems at the city of Jericho, right? So during the late Bronze Age, when you should have this massive city and these massive um, fortifications, you have scant late Bronze Age remains. Um, there's like a middle building. You have like j just very minimal, minimal occupation, village level occupation. Um, and one of the arguments is, well, you know, maybe erosion just washed it all away. All those late Bronze Age remains, the city wall, all that, it's all gone because of right. erosion. And it's like, this is one of these possibility arguments, right? Isn't it possible that erosion washed it all away? Well, I mean, is it possible? Maybe, but like Piotr Biankowski uh, wrote this extensive book in the like mid to late 80s, I think. And he basically, I mean, just, just as everybody has said since then, um, look, you would expect something to be left over in in the strata, right? You would expect there to be a buildup of uh, this erosion, uh, and we don't see it. So uh, that to, to sort of you know, solidify that. Could um, angels have come down and vacuumed they, they it up? They could have. They could have. That could is happen. possible. Yeah. Um, so chapter four uh, goes into the Exodus. Is it history or is it myth or something in between? And again, no one is trying to make the argument that this is the position that you should take. In other words, the, the chapter doesn't end with, so Ron Hendel is correct. You should see this as cultural memory, right? Or um, any of these positions. It's, it's not meant to be a positive, like here's what you should think. Uh, there is, a lot of those things are hotly contested. Um, but what is the consensus position on uh, the historical reliability of the story in Exodus, right? And, well, that is that scholars say you can't just pick up the book of Exodus and write your history. It just doesn't work that way. Um, so we go through the evidence there. Um, and just very quickly, chapter five is on violence and genocide commands, divine commands of violence and genocide in the Hebrew Bible. So looking at the two big apologetic arguments, it's all hyperbole. Um, and the Canaanites were just really, really wicked, or the Amalekites were just really, really wicked. Um, so we tackle those two problems. Do they work? Uh, and of course, the answer is no, and I can talk about that at all if you want. Um, and then chapter six is on sex crimes in the ancient Near East. And I had Jay Caballero, who's writing his dissertation under Bruce Wells on sex crimes. I had him go through it, and he was fairly meticulous because he's a judge. Um and, and, and uh, a, he's not only a reputable scholar, he's a Christian, but he's yeah, that's not right. a An fundamentalist. Exactly. Yeah. Like, yeah. So he's like, but he sees, he yeah. has ways of rationalizing it in his own head, but he's not an apologist at all. He no, lays it out there. So just letting people know. And he, like, he pulled no punches with my chapter, right? Uh, and I incorporated a lot of the things that he, that he suggested because um, it's his wheelhouse. Um, so we talk about rape and adultery. Those are the two crimes that we look at and is essentially asking the question, um, is the Old Testament so much more morally progressive? In other words, is it taking what is in the ancient Near East and saying, no, 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 we're not going to do it that way. We're going to do it this morally progressive way, right? So we just look at the laws, at the law collections. Um, and we deal, just as a teaser, we deal in depth with that really thorny that people think is thorny problem of Deuteronomy 22, 28 to 29, um, where a, uh, an unbetrothed virgin, is she raped? And if she's raped, then the penalty is that she has to marry her rapist if the father says so. Like, and of course, apologizes, that ah, doesn't mean rape, it's consensual sex. Yeah, well, so we go into all that. Um, and the final chapter uh, before the conclusion, obviously, is something that is near and dear to my heart because Kip is here, and Kip and I did a lot of work on this together, and a lot of that showed up in the chapter, and that is on, did the Old Testament plagiarize? Um, so I was really excited to, to put that chapter in there because a lot of the kinks got worked out as Kip and I kind of went back and forth with it uh, to respond to Inspiring Philosophy uh, on his video. Um, and there's still a second video that maybe we'll come out with 
Maybe. Uh, maybe. Uh, sorry, I we probably shouldn't have said that live. <laughs> we just, have the script. Uh, yeah, it's just about finding the time and the yeah. to put it all together, right? So, uh, yeah. And I, you know, yeah, I get So, no, go. Uh, you go ahead. Well, that's that. That's what's in the book. Um, and again, the goal is the overarching like thread that runs through it. I guess you can't have an overarching thread, but the thread that runs through it is how do you address these issues, uh, keeping in mind the is it po isn't it possible that argument, right? How do you address that? How do you handle it? When a Christian apologist says, well, you know, God must have just had morally, you know, justified reasons to kill all those infants, right? Or, you know, Isaiah 55, like God's ways are higher than our ways, right? We just can't understand it. Isn't it possible that, is, that, that God just had a good reason to do that? Like, how do you handle that? Uh, that's what I deal with, uh, particularly in the introduction and the conclusion. I almost want to, like, just get a teaser and just say as far as modern day, what we mean by plagiarism, if you were in a college mm -hmm. course and someone brought you the Enuma Elish or brought yeah. you the Mesopotamian literature and then brought you Genesis yes. as a professor grading papers, would you say they were plagiarizing by modern account? Like if you were in a school and you saw a paper here written and then you saw this one, would you say, hold up, someone's using someone else's work here? Kip, I'll let you. Yeah, no. Um, by that, by that standard, then absolutely. But I think yeah. part of what gets missed in this is mm -hmm. that uh, you know the reason uh, the reason pl plagiarism is is viewed as problematic is be because we've you know over the hundreds of years of literary production of uh, of publishing especially like once certainly once once people started making money hmm. uh off of their intellectual property i mean that's really where you know this idea of intellectual property became became significant enough to develop actual laws around it and for universities to you know develop conventions about what's you know what's acceptable what's not acceptable which is why you know citation needed is is essentially the uh the rule of the game but this is not this is not what uh what writing was like in the ancient right. world right. um yes by modern standards you put the enuma elish next to uh the book of genesis you plug both of them into uh turn it in dot com that would be a fun exercise <laughs> you know <laughs> you plug them in uh there's stuff that's going to get flagged yeah and um and that and i mean that's all we're saying but the other side of this coin is that this is part of like this is part of the ancient literary convention right right uh, you I, know they operated under different rules they had different ideas about uh well, I mean, about intellectual property, if that was even such a thing, uh, it was perfectly normal, acceptable, and and expected that you're going to draw from this wealth of... of this is the problem, and I, I, I'm painting this, and I'm sure your chapter deals with this. The reason that's even something people say is with this idea that you're pointing out here is your work and you're plagiarizing and people are making monetary value based on their ideas. So others are copying their ideas. Well, before that, that wasn't a concern. Christian apologists and those who aren't Christian apologists that are kind of going back and forth, this unique book that we have that is from God and it is inspired and infallible without error and it will tell you how you should live your life or get cooked by all eternity in hell by this loving God who loves you so much. Like, okay, there's a lot on the line and they're pushing this and they're fundamentalist and they're arguing this perfect book. Ours is right. Others are false. So it becomes that question that gets created because it's like, okay, hold up. I see Mesopotamian overtones and and even direct engagement attacking their mythology which makes 
that question a valid one, I think, in light of that kind of proposition. So if there weren't fundamentalists running around, like if I talk to a Roman Catholic, what do they say? They go, oh, yeah, 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 definitely. It's mythology. What do you mean it's mythology? The Mesopotamian? Oh, no, no, no. Biblical Genesis. What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I accept that Genesis is biblical mythology with legend and, you know, and all that. Cool. Okay. It's the others who create that question and make that such a big deal. But I just want to say we're going to get to your super chat soon. Thank you so much for all the support. Anyway. <laughs> and, yeah. you know, this is why um, I had a friend that I went to seminary with that went off and got his PhD down at Dallas. And, um, like, I love him. He's still very much my friend. But, um, yeah, I remember talking to him as I was going through uh, and learning Sumerian. And I remember asking him, uh, we talked like three years into the program and I said, Hey, like, how, how do you like deal with the fact that the Mesopotamian flood tradition is directly influencing, um, the Hebrew Bible? Uh, you know, I mean, it's, 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 it's using it. Right. And his response was, as I'm sure many people have heard, no, no, there was an actual flood event. And the Sumerian and Achaean versions are Satan's corrupted versions. Um, and they just came down in two different traditions. And the biblical one is the true one. And like setting aside all the historical problems with that, uh, <laughs> of which there are many, um, it's just such a, it's clearly such a, what an ad hoc response, right? It's like, how do I, how do I make this thing that I know to be right? How do I make it fit? Um, and yeah, again, it's, it's dealing with the book deals with those types of responses, because what do you say to somebody who says, isn't it possible that, how do you address that? Um, and address it, I, I think effectively. I think yeah. comedy helps with that for sure. It, Did you want to yeah. say something? Kip? No, I, I was just, I was reminded. Um, I, I just returned from, um, uh, from holidays. Uh, my wife and I, every, every summer, uh, go to the interior. I've got a very good friend, uh, that I grew up with. He owns some property, uh, out there. And, uh, it's like a meetup every summer for, a group of us friends who all like grew up together. Um, super fun. So these are guys that I've known since I was like little, 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 like five, six years old. Right. Um, so one of my, and I, I think I've, I've talked a little bit about this before, but one of my friends is a, he is a pastor at a, it's either, I, I get this mixed up all the time. It's either regular Baptist or union. Baptist Union Church. Um, and he's, you know, he's, he's been to a seminary, he's gone, he, he's taken uh, courses in the languages, and he's gone through critical theory. And, you know, so he knows this stuff, right? Um, I have another friend who, uh, who, who has not, but is like, pretty super fundamentalist and uh we had a uh we were hanging out at the campfire one night just kind of chatting through some of this stuff and uh I, I don't even remember how uh we ended up getting on to talking about evolution and then talking about the book of genesis and you know, my, my friend, the, uh, the Baptist pastor who's, who's spent, you know, years in seminary and, and reads prolifically about this stuff, teaches it every Sunday morning, right? And myself, uh, a PhD in biblical studies, trying to explain to our other buddy, you know, what's really going on in the creation stories you know, the fact there's two of them and the fact that they're saying slightly different things and, you know, how we 
how we gauge and understand this is literature because it's very much like the all this other comparative literature from the ancient near east and we were you know piling up this this information on the basis of of uh um you know modern critical scholarship and after all that my other buddy goes huh it's interesting but you guys are totally wrong <laughs> I don't know what the hell. What do you do with that? You know. What do you do, right? <laughs> yeah. Look, I, I know what you do. I know what you do. You let everybody know to go get this book. This book that's out. It'll save your friend's soul from uh, what do you call this? Uh, cognitive dissonance. That's right. And other things. Maybe maybe they have a chance at listening to serious academics uh, on their position. I just posted the link in the chat. So this is the latest greatest. On the Atheist Handbook to the Old Testament, Volume 2, with Dr. Joshua Bowen. And, of course, many minds and uh, scholars, if you will, were behind editing and correcting and peer-reviewing. Of course, yeah. this is self-published, so it's not through an academic press. It doesn't need to be. <laughs> this isn't for the academic world. I mean, this is like speaking, you know, first-grade English in america okay like it's common sense to the academic world These this is this is that background information that kip doesn't have two years to teach you right when when he when, when you come to kip and say how do you know that the word hola doesn't mean ladder right it's 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 that level <laughs> it's that level of stuff where it's like just read this book, right? It, it'll it, it, maybe not with that particular because uh, it's not a Hebrew course, but um, you know the, the the background information of how do you know that there aren't two traditions, one Sumerian that's corrupted by Satan, and one well here, just go read the history, right, uh, of right. the period. So that's hey, that's what this is intended to do. Can you can we get a a, a bigger picture of the cover? Um. Let me do this. Let me see if I can zoom in on the Joker. Hold on. Here we go. And maybe I'd like to. Oh, there. Yeah, that helps. Cool. I only just noticed that the picture is different. That's oh, so Joshua that, Jericho. That's Jericho. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how do you uh, how do you choose your your uh, your pictures for the front, Josh? Um, you know, I say, Megan, what do you think we should put on there? <clears throat> And she says, oh, my gosh, because uh, I had the idea of uh, taking the picture from volume one and like backing out because it's zoomed in on the cover and like, backing out to have a bigger. And she said, no, nah, we should have a different picture. And she was right. And she always okay. is. And if you it's you can't probably tell and I don't have volume one sitting in here, but it's a slightly darker shade of gray so that when you really? set it next to volume one, it looks very, very similar but it's oh. distinct enough that you can, I wonder if you you're going to finally it's... get it to go to black. So many volumes, then, then <laughs> yeah. the thought has to be white yeah. at the end. It'll be interesting. Um, it's, it'll be just like spinal taps. The last volume will just be like spinal taps, taps album, smell the glove, <laughs> which is, which is nothing but a, but a black, but a black album cover. And it's as if it can't get any blacker. Hmm. So listen, we have a lot of fans and support and questions, super chats, all of the above. I want us to be conscientious of that. I figure I'd wait a while, let us discuss what we're getting into, and then get into these. Um, maybe we'd be as concise as we can, because being mindful, others might end up throwing something up and they hope we can get to it. Um, let's jump into this, and I'll follow you guys wherever you go. All I ask the audience to do is please go get a copy of the book. Um if you can, if you can afford it, get a copy of the book and like the video, share this content out there. Let others know about it, especially when it comes to the apologists. Let them do responses and try and be critical because they're not just coming at Josh here. It would yeah. be great to have them go against mainstream, critical scholarship and all of these different fields. But of course, they know better. You know, they always this know better. This is why my position, I always feel so safe with it, because whatever I say, I'm not doing this alone, right? It's like, well, if you're proving me wrong, like, you know, 
go get your Nobel Prize. I mean, not really, but like you're, you know, you're you're having to deal with all the people that I'm referencing, which is in at almost every turn the consensus on whatever position I'm talking about. So. All right, all right. Constellation Pegasus. Can Dr. Josh write a book on the topic of the flat earth and dome cosmology all by itself? Ben Stanhope's book is devastating. By the way, this week I'm recording with Ben Stanhope on oh, cool. the Creation Museum. But but yeah. Uh, there will be a chapter in volume three on that, uh, Ancient Near Eastern Cosmology and the Afterlife. Uh, I don't know if... Yeah, I don't know... I, I mean, I guess, I guess I could. Yeah. It's kind of interesting. Ben's, Ben's already written one. Is that what I'm reading here? He, I think he wrote against the creation museum. That's what I think he did. Of course, oh, okay. he's going to point out okay. he does go. Oh, into this. I bet that, I bet that, that message, that last sentence is a message for Derek. Because you just did Ben Stanhope, didn't you? Well, I did one on um, just the relationship between things we found archaeologically with Israel, how they're using stamps with like Horus and the Lotus and like weird things in Israel's stuff. Uh, we didn't get into this. That's the one yeah. I'm doing this week. I'm actually going to be setting up the live stream. Ben's coming on to talk about the Creation Museum and the absurdity of Ken Ham and yeah. all of that fun stuff. So the, the fun thing about about Flat Earth and Dome Cosmology um, from a biblical perspective is that it, in my experience, much of the time, uh, the, the, the biblical flat earthers are actually pretty insightful when it comes to what the text says. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, when, when you already, when like, you already, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, it, it's, it's, uh, it's utter obvious scientific yes. nonsense, right. but you know, they it they come by it pretty honestly if you're strictly committed to the truth of this book i think if, in fact when i you know when i uh uh the last time i taught uh an intro class to like an, an actual classroom of students i think at one point i i i would tell them if you were really serious about being a biblical literalist then you should go check these guys out because you know when it comes to taking the text at face value they are they're serious about it and they do mm -hmm. a, you know they're not wrong about a lot of what's going on i will tell everybody this though you josh and i'm also going to be having aaron adair on who's actually a scientist uh, he worked on CERN and all of that. I mean, yeah, you guys are going to come on. And didn't you love that message that he sent me? That what he was like, listen, there's stuff in the Bible that the Bible says. And at the time this is being written, others actually had the correct answer, but they purposely went with a different answer. Like, we're going to get into all of this, how the Bible purposely chooses to get the wrong answer, thinking it's right. But I do think it's interesting what you're saying. And I'll get to the next one is that, Wait, look at Mormons. Look at how they notice exactly what Francesca Stavrakopoulou has been saying all along. God has a body. God is not incorporeal. That's later. They have the sensitivity to seeing that stuff, and clearly it's in their theology. They accept that. So it's it's kind of once you accept it, you can see it everywhere, and it's really there. And Interesting. Sorry. I just got distracted by doorknob head who asked if I would start a class like the professor and God's not. Dead. <laughs> yeah, I am. I am just like professor Radisson. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> Constellation Pegasus. My hours at work can be crazy. Sometimes better to buy my salvation than earn it. That's right. I mean, look, I, I always recommend that, you know, it's, yeah. It's the best way to get it. Ruby Snow says, talk about an unholy trinity. You guys are awesome. Thank you, Ruby. Thank you. Uh, Pat Lowinger, thank you for the super chat. The academic <laughs> talent is pretty shallow today. <laughs> There's another uh, archaeologist that reviewed the book, uh, and he actually handed it to several of his archaeology uh, colleagues on the dig that he was on and said, hey, read through this. So I wow. feel very good about um you know what the information that's in there and i did before it got reviewed again because i'm not saying anything groundbreaking 
Um, to be fair, Pat has uh, has laughed at me quite a bit because uh, some of the terms that I use, uh, you know, sort of betray that I'm an Assyriologist and not an archaeologist. So, okay, use the word layers. He laughs at me as well. He should. <laughs> Thank you, Pat. Everyone needs a smile. Question for both. What historical event within your specialization is accepted by the majority of lay people but rejected by the majority of historians? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, wow. Do you, can, can you think of anything off the top of your head, Josh? I mean, I don't see, I don't know. Here in the U.S., among like church going people maybe and again i don't i don't know those numbers but in my experience um like the conquest account is something that i would say that uh you know most historians would say no uh you can't just read through the book of joshua and write your history where i would say at least a very very large percentage uh high percentage of church going people have asked in America, they would say, yeah, that, that happened maybe, but that's not my field statistics. So or whatever. Um, I, from within, within the, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, I'll say there's like, there's two extremes here and they, and they tend to exist almost exclusively within, uh, within uh, popular culture. In fact, I was, I was reading comments on, on an old video that you and I did, Derek, uh, like a year ago about the scrolls, which exemplified exactly what I'm talking about here. On the one hand, you've got this camp that has this very, very esoteric perspective of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Like there are these, 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 th this hidden treasure trove of this, you know, crazy Jewish mystery religion that that illustrates, you know, the 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 mythical uh, origins of Jesus along with uh, the lost twelve tribes. Like, there's there's all this this crazy stuff. As in, as if the Dead Sea Scrolls solve everything about. Right. Uh, this is the Dan Brown uh, school of uh, of you know. The Dead Sea Scrolls are the key to the uh, uh, to the true history of the uh, of the Roman Catholic Church, or 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 to what what actual actual Judaism was was like before before it got corrupted in the in the second or third century CE, and all of that is just utter nonsense. Um, but then on the other side. Uh, you also have uh, strong apologetics. One of my favorites is the strong apologetic argument from, uh, from, uh, well, predominantly Christian apologists who will just say, you know, the text of the Bible as we have it is identical to what is in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, now, this isn't such a bald-faced lie as it is a, a little bit more misleading because while on several metrics that's true um that is far from the complete story because within the dead sea scrolls we have multiple copies of multiple different versions of 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 biblical texts and you really have to kind of pick and choose uh when you're rooting through them to get to to get to the version that that you want in this case the one that matches up perfectly with whatever it is we have today Mm. I bet it's a lot of fun. <laughs> um, hold on one second. Let me see. Yeah, you're not being very direct. That's exactly right. I just had to say our, our private chat here. I was like, you know, there's only, I don't know, 40, 50 super chats. If you guys want to be here for another four hours, feel free. Uh, I, uh, I'll walk away for a while and come back. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but yeah, let's try to obviously get to everybody as much as we can. But I do want to answer the question. So, Humanist Reformation, thank you for that super chat. Keep up the honest work, guys. Fight the cultist pushing for a theocracy in the United States. All of our religious freedoms are at stake. Thanks. Well said. Yeah, I'm very to the point. Thank you. 
Casper, thank you for the super chat. It's weird that apologetics courses are even a thing. There are no persuade people that X is true courses for any other X. Love you guys. Totally. Yeah, I mean, it's like it's like the dissertation defense that never ends. Yeah. Right. And no matter how many people are sitting around the table saying, no, that, that doesn't work. No, 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 it does. And let me find a way to show you how it does. Is it possible no? that it could yeah. be this? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> nah, fam, just rewrite it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Casper. Good point. Uh, Constellation Pegasus makes sense. YouTube is a protection for people like Winger, sheltered from criticism and a public place to hide. We're going to do a respond video. Um, we're going to pick out what we probably want to respond to. Got to be cautious because. But I, I also think we, sh we should we should be honest and under no illusions about the fact that every, you know, we could do a million response videos and yeah. and, and yeah. Uh, uh, wingers or, you know, whoever's uh, followers would, would never even see it. I mean, it's just by the nature of, of how how this sort of insular these insular communities work. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that uh, super chat constellation. Lin Lintutus, I hope I'm saying that right. How do you respond to those who say, what I have experienced, I cannot explain it to you. How do you deal with my experiences were supernatural? For me personally, <laughs> um, you know, I speaking as somebody who had, supernatural ex supernatural experiences things that i can't explain that happened to me that mm -hmm. i still you know grapple with and i've i've read a little bit and i've listened to people who know better than i do about how the brain works and you know how you how 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 these sorts of things can can appear to be so so real and effective uh to us i mean i i readily agree with uh with these sorts of these sorts of responses to me, um, and I, I also think it's important not to not to diminish uh, people's people's uh, let's say transcendent experiences. experiences. Yeah, uh, it's, especially in view of the fact that, in my view, that, uh, that that that's really the 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 whole groundswell of of religion is on the basis of this, what it does for me, how it makes me feel, how mm -hmm. I can see, or at least I perceive that it improves my own life. Josh, did you want to make a response to that? Yeah. I mean, I, you know, from a, any type of a professional standpoint, I would, I, I wouldn't address it at all. <clears throat> um, personally, if, you know, somebody said that and was honestly like, I, you know, I, I want to know is, is it this deity? Uh, that I believe that it is, you know, maybe I would walk them through <clears throat> some of the problematic divine commands that are in the Old Testament and say, now, is this the God that you worship? Is he an unchanging God? Like, does this make sense to you that he would do things like call for genocide or endorse slavery or, you know, whatever? Um, but again, I think always having to leave it back in their court because, you know, I don't, I don't have uh, any education in brain states or whatever, uh, so, uh, you know, all yeah. I can, all I can give you is what I know. So a brief comment for me is it, it is a matter of, you gotta be a people person. You kind of have to read people and understand what, what are they coming at you because they're scared and afraid? Are they reacting? And therefore they don't really want their bubble to pop because it might harm them. Or are they actually at a point where they're like, I really want to know the answer. Or I'm interested in knowing, like, how do you honestly answer this? You're not going to hurt my feelings. Tell me what you think is going on and how, how would you explain that? And I would say look into more science. Look into more of how the mind works, psychology, things like that. And I would even refer them to Darren Brown's video, which I linked in the upcoming response video to William Lane Craig, where it's faith and fear. And he shows how he, an atheist, under the guise of being a religious person, uh, converts an atheist and gives her a religious experience. He manufactures it. And once he pops the bubble at the end and tells her what he did, she can't even explain. She even is shocked at her experience. What he did is he took actual real experiences that she had from her relationship with her father and her mother and real things, and then applied it just one step further 
to agency beyond humans. And he did this with an idea or a concept. We call it God. So it's really fascinating to watch that episode to be mind blown. Anyway, sorry, that was more than just a comment. Constellation Pegasus just had a thought. If these scholar apologists believe in Christianity when they have no right to knock down Jehovah's Witnesses on the same grounds, they reject information about themselves. If these, uh, sound like it was going to be a question, but they have no right to knock down Jehovah's Witnesses on the same grounds they reject information about themselves. Well, every, I think like every Christian group kind of competes with the correct version of something they think they have or whatever. What are your thoughts? Is it, is it saying that, uh, I don't have a lot of experience with Jehovah's Witnesses, but is it by, by knocking the legs out from under Jehovah's Witnesses theology that they're knocking out their own theological ground? I think it's the idea that they're saying they, that what you see apologists do, and I see it all the time as I've been involving myself with Islam, is they go and they poke holes and show how Muhammad and the Quran uses Bible, blah, 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 blah. And they are so quick to show a problem. Yeah. And the very thing that they're actually accusing the other cult of or the other system of beliefs is actually something I'm going, bro, you are – there's the big wooden – Stake in your eye, you can't even see this is applying to your own position, and you don't even realize it. I will give you a very small teaser in chapter five <clears throat> about divine commands of violence and genocide. One of the things that we do is we we say, okay, um, if it's good for the goose, it's good for the gander. So if you're saying that the biblical text says that the Canaanites or the Amalekites or the Hittites or whatever are so, so wicked that they deserve to be, you know, eradicated. <clears throat> um, then let's go look at Neo-Assyrian royal inscriptions, right? And let's see what their motivation was and if it came from their God and if it was because their enemies were wicked and sinful and rebellious. If you're good with it here in the biblical text, you're good with it over here with the Assyrians. And if you say no, Why? And it, it falls back to special pleading. Special pleading. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Oh, I can't wait to read that because that was something brought up in the recent debate with Dr. Mott uh, and yes. Jonathan Sheffield, which I was like, I had to ask that question in the Q&A. So thank you. Carlos Rodriguez, thank you for the super chat. Need the Dr. Josh and Dr. Kip duo to do a video picking apart the popular Dennis Prager videos on the Old Testament. Prager is a conservative Jewish apologist who makes ridiculous claims about the Hebrew Bible. I'd pay to see it. <laughs> I don't know that I'm familiar. I've never heard of. Yeah. I've, Kip, are you familiar? Uh, yeah, I've. Uh, do you know Prager? You? He's like a. He's like a okay. political. I know like that political name. Activist who spews all sorts of nonsense about. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'm happy to look into it. Just right, but I. I'm not sure if I've seen, I, I think I've seen one of his, he did a video about, um, about how awesome the 10 commandments are, <laughs> uh, which was amusing. <laughs> With but women think, right next to the guy, property. Oh, there you go. <laughs> okay. Rational Bible. Yeah. The Bible will save America. Oh, there you go. Gosh. Yeah. yeah. Well, Look how many people are. Worth, he's got some views on this thing, so it's yeah. worth looking into for sure. Okay, yeah. worth considering. Yeah, email me, remind me, because uh, you know yeah. I, my head wasn't attached to my body. You know what they say. I really do appreciate that. Arabian princess says it's all fun and games until the end hits us all. Well, let's just keep having fun then. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that super chat, Arabian Princess. I appreciate that. Constellation Pegasus over here huh. buying indulgences. Yeah, I'll say. <laughs> Five years ago, I'd laugh at the three of you. That is so true. I'd laugh at myself, by the way. Uh, all of us would, I think. Uh, now, after spending thousands of dollars on old watchtower literature and deconstructed from Christianity and Judaism, now it's hard not to live without the three of you. Amazing mm -hmm. how tides can oh. turn. Yeah. Thanks, man. Wow. Yeah. Wow. 
Wow. Wow. It is, it is crazy to think about, and I did as I was writing, particularly this volume, so many of the things <clears throat> that I'm responding to in these chapters are things that I would have said, right? Mm. Um, <laughs> You're talking to yourself. You're yeah, debating yeah, like, yourself. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so many times I just stop and say, come on, son. <laughs> Oh, I need to show the book just so I could keep reminding people because some people come in and out. Make sure you get the book. Make sure you get the book. It's going to be a and blast. it's you know it's 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 not a small. Let me show thing. you. It's, it's again it's, you know. Uh, oh, many, for for those of you who live in states that don't have conceal and carry laws, this book can come <laughs> in very very handy. I got an email actually right before this sh or during the beginning of the show, literally like a pissed off at me. I subscribed to your channel. I saw the notification for your show with Dr. Josh. I was disgusted, not because of the guest, but because of your artwork. How dare you use a firearm? Have you not read the headlines? We have an epidemic of gun violence. Oh my God. And I'm like, it's a joke. <laughs> it's a joke. Like, Ouch. okay. Now, if you take this seriously, I mean, <laughs> please. I don't actually, I felt bad because I don't actually know what it is. It's I, I found like a, a two assassins, and I and, and Is it I just like a, Assassin's Creed. Oh, I don't play video games, but that's yeah. what I wanted. I just assumed it was something in popular culture that I wasn't aware of because I'm such a nerd. <laughs> At night, I play uh, Call of Duty Modern Warzone when I want to do like chill out. But I don't. know. Well, I I'm, I can I can promise, knowing both of the gentlemen and myself on this yeah. panel, like. Nothing ill was intended, and no. we're, I'm very sorry if I if think that, we're in a tough spot too. Yeah. I mean, I don't that you know. I trust me. I'm. It's, but I can. I I want to just say like, if that has offended you, I'm sorry. Uh, was yeah. not intention. It was, a, like, I literally. You could see Josh is kind of actually. Well, I tried to do a good job it, of making it look real, but it's. We, you know. I don't know. In retrospect, maybe we should have used the Road Warriors picture. <laughs> That was a good one. That was a good one. But that's pretty okay. violent. Oh, rush. <laughs> Constellation, thanks for that 50, man. Seriously. I'll remember you when you enter through my gates in heaven. Indo, thank you for the super chat. You may buy your slaves from the heathens around you. Were these people selling themselves or no? Why was this kind of slavery in the Bible voluntary? Yeah. So I write about this pretty extensively in uh, pull the book. Up. Uh, did the Old Testament endorse slavery? And also there's a chapter in volume one of the Atheist Handbook to the Old Testament uh, that deals with slavery. So the specifics they're talking about, Leviticus 25, 44 to 46, um, the specifics of where, you know, how the people that are coming uh, as slaves or uh, from, from the nations around or from the tenant farmers that are in their midst, how they became slaves is not really dealt with in the passage because that's not really the point. I think we can rest pretty uh, safe, safely assured that when it talks about the tenant farmers, uh, the Toshavim that are living in their midst, uh, that these are people that have defaulted on loans uh, and are taking it as, as, uh, as debt slaves, that the, the passage is saying there is no requirement to release them. Um, so they can be kept permanently. Uh, is it possible that the text is allowing for, uh, I mean, I, I suspect that it probably is allowing for, is it possible? Prison, you know, uh, people, people during wartime being taken captive, uh, or, th you know, those that had fallen into debt bondage and had been, um, converted, uh, to chattel slavery that they could be purchased, uh, because that's something that happens, in the surrounding nations, but um, yeah, I just don't think the text is being terribly specific. Thank you, thank you. It's a good Indo. question. Constellation back again. People like Toby Singer about suck me into Judaism, but that didn't happen. Once your bubble has popped, like leaving watch Watchtower, researching and critical thinking skills never leave or fail you. Yeah, it is a, it is an interesting thing. I'll give one example. Uh, I tweeted a couple of weeks ago, um, uh, a man went into a 
religious place of uh, place of worship and uh, in a suicide act destroyed the building bringing it down and killing 3000 people his name was Samson <laughs> that's right and you know people responded to that um and it's one of those stories that in any context outside of the book of judges you would say that's a terrorist mm -hmm. but in the book of judges well i mean the philistines are really bad people and look hebrews chapter 11 says he's one of the great heroes of the faith so it must have been a good thing Wait, mate. you don't even you don't even think about it wow yeah but i got I, yeah, I, I gotta say i mean i Constellation Pegasus certainly deserves every benefit of the doubt here because, I mean, Tobias Singer is so charismatic, I think he could probably convert me to Judaism. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love him to death, and I don't I don't rock the boat with him on my channel. I respect no, no. his boundaries, but it's interesting to hear a Jew looking at the New Testament and, and approaching it like he is, he's seeing things like we talked about earlier, flat earthers see flat earth, Mormons see a body of God. And he's seeing a lot of anti-Jewish sentiment that you wouldn't find the same way. I try to get myth visionaries that watch to understand when I have woman scholarship, come on, they're seeing the sexuality in everything. I mean, like I did not realize how much, it's sensitive even in the crucifixion of Jesus. I had Celine uh, Dilly, her last name. She's the dean of the Jesus Seminar. Come on. And she explained how Rome penetrated by crucifixion, penetration, the, the act of feminizing the enemy because they are the impenetrable. And like she was explaining things I never for a moment really, really let it sink in, like the book of Revelation, the Apocalypse of John. The whore of Babylon. Notice he's talking crap about Rome. He's making Rome into not only a whore, but a, a female. So it's like there's so much uh, misogyny and like just a lot of stuff. If we're sensitive to look at it, we'll find it. It's there. Thank you, Constellation, for that. David, can you uh, – thank you for the super chat. Can you ask the good doctors if there are any accurate Bible translations they recommend for Philistines like myself who can't read Hebrew – can't wait to read Josh's new book. You all are great. I always recommend the NIV. Wow. I mean, unless unless you're trying to get to, uh, you know, some sort of uh, precise wooden word for word translation, uh, I think the NIV in many many places does the text justice. Uh, in getting the meaning across. Um, but I haven't had to do that in so long that there's probably a lot better ones out there now. But Kip, I mean, maybe they should listen to you. <laughs> no, probably not. I know the... Uh, I mean, I I use... I particularly like uh, uh, Jewish, uh, Jewish Publication Society because it tends to have a stronger... Um, well, a stronger Jewish flavor uh, to the text, uh, the the English text that that I prefer. Um, but I have to say, I mean, by and large, uh, and this isn't a very unsatisfying answer, but by and large, most of the English translations are are, are very good, right? And the unfortunate thing in this is that um, most of the issues that that you're going to encounter um, through scholarship with the text don't have to do with controversies in regards to the translation. I mean, most of the problem stems from, you know, the, the holes we have in history as well as the, you know, the, the huge gap that, uh, that exists and persists between just even like, like a modern epistemology and ontology versus, you know, an ancient ways of, of reading and writing and just the very, you know, just on a basic level, what was important to these people who were writing 
uh, from this culture and this place? And how does that get misconstrued uh, through just a straightforward communication of what's on the page of the text? Like this isn't a translation issue so much as this is a much larger uh, worldview issue that no translation is really going to help you with. I'm sorry about that. So, you know, that's that's where reading books like Josh's is, is, is super helpful. And, and yeah, yeah most is. people just don't have the time to or the energy or the money. To... And I did I did my own translation, so that's not helpful either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, being one who could read it. So real quick, I want everybody to know, watching, of course, hit the like button. Please, uh, no more questions, Super Chats. Um, Dr. Josh has to go in about 24 minutes or so to do dinner for his family. They all have COVID. And everybody except me. Ex well, you're the only one not suffering from it, at least, right? All right. So I wear this bad boy. Yeah, sure. so I yeah, want to sure. make sure we can get wow. through the super chats. Just keeping that in mind, gentlemen, and let's keep rolling. But uh, no more questions, super chats, please. I ask just because I don't want to leave you hanging. Um, let's rock and roll. Sid Dave, Old Testament is mythology like ancient Greek religion. It's astonishing this Middle Eastern mythology is taken seriously by by people as if it is world history. Yeah, I, let it be what it is, you know, and like nobody struggles with the Epic of Gilgamesh. Like trying to find the garden with the the jewels hanging from the trees, like that, that nobody worries about that. And they 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 recognize it as a, a piece of literature that can have meaning outside of being literally true. Hmm. Yeah. You you just amen to that one. Get amen. JC, thank you for the super chat. Religious studies are too important to leave to apologists and fundamentalists. Thank you to these scholars for coming out of the ivory tower to teach via Myth Vision podcast. Thank you. Thank you. I thank hope we're you. doing it justice. I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> Sentinel Apologetics. Rob, Derek, I don't know better than Josh Kipp. I appeal to legit peer-reviewed scholarship the same way josh and kip do the difference is theological do you want to i don't i don't know what he's referring to specifically here uh one of the things that might fit this uh so when i wrote the chapter on ezekiel 26 uh there are good evangelical scholars that have written on this again i disagree with their conclusions because they're theologically based. Uh, but somebody like Chris Udd, for example, essentially wrote an article saying, here are all the stupid apologetics that uh, are used to try to explain Ezekiel 26. Uh, you know, and somebody like Robert Chisholm would say, uh, again, a more theologically nuanced one that I disagree with, but that uh, you know, prophecy is inherently contingent. And so that must have been what happened with, um, you know, the, the king of Tyre. He, he must have repented. And so, you know, that's why it wasn't destroyed. Again, is that possible? Sure. I mean, then you have to extend it to Egypt. Like, do you want to do that? I don't know. But yeah. So I don't know if that's what he's talking about, but. I must have made a comment earlier, um, generalizing apologetics and apologist in some way. Um, and there are various flavors, if you will, and degrees in which people approach this stuff as apologists. And I like to think that Rob is one of the guys who actually is more at least trying to have the conversations more rather than extreme fundamentalists that we know of as apologists. But, yeah, that might have been something I said when it comes to this idea. I don't know. But I thank you for the super chat. Really, I appreciate it. I mean, I, very, 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 very quickly, like one of the things that I've heard Rob say in the past, um, you know, is talking about ancient Near Eastern cosmology and, uh, you know, cosmic geography. And like, you know, he cites people like uh, John Walton, who I disagree with on a number of things. But, you know, I mean, he's very clear. Uh, same as with people like Richard Averbeck or Lawson Younger, or, you know, any of these people that I, I do respect. Uh, would say, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, flat earth cosmology. Like this is it's a big dome overhead. Yeah, this is that's what they're thinking. So mm -hmm. that's good. Yeah. And I mean, I think if we're calling it what it is and not trying to make it something else because it sounds absurd or they got it wrong, um, that's an honest yeah. approach. Even if you wanted to say 
well, I still consider myself somewhat under the umbrella of apologetics, but, uh, but yeah, I'd like to see more honest approaches to things like that from apologists. Um, Brady Goodwin, thank you for the super chat. Love you guys. Do you have any thoughts on the conversion of Heli Heliodorus in Second Maccabees versus the Heliod Heliodus column in India? Who wore it best or originated the story? Do you know? Do, any you, know who, do you know who Brady is? So Brady is a uh, former member of the rap group that I can't remember, and I'm so terrible. Um, but he, uh, he he deconverted uh, in the recent recent past. Uh, but a very popular Christian rap group uh, that is it has him? cross in it. Yeah, no yeah. Way. Oh wow! Um, wow. But. Uh, I feel yep, bad Brady, that I don't like, know anything about the helium. Yeah, I know. Like, way too late for me, unfortunately. Oh. <laughs> if you no, email I, me, though, Brady, I can I, I can try to reach. Out. Yeah, we could definitely find, like, somebody like uh, John Collins. That'd be a great question for, I would imagine. Email me. I, I got to get him back on anyway. He said he was busy for the last couple months. But, yeah, oh, email right. me, Derek at MythVision Podcast. The Cross Movement. The Cross Movement. Thank you, Brady. That's the, the, That's the rap group. group. Yeah. So thank you. Wow. Appreciate yeah. that super chat. Yeah, email me please cuz I would love to get your question answered. Scholar Vids, is Kip Davis still upset because he <laughs> was second place to Seth Andrews as the voice in Joshua Bowen's audiobook? It's it's uh I I barely made it here because <laughs> He said, I can't do the audio, but you know what? I'll help edit the damn yeah. thing. <laughs> there are so many people that are happy that Seth is doing it instead of me. Instead of me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not Seth could read the me. phone book, right? You know, <laughs> that's just how it is. Um, he's like, uh, yeah, he's he's like a very cool updated version of that guy. Uh, I just love that guy's voice. What was his name? Um, Paul. Oh, um, the rest of the story guide. You remember the rest that? of the story? Yeah. Uh, yeah, man. What was Paul? What a voice. Paul Harvey. That's it. Paul Good day. <laughs> Jess Lee, thank you for the super chat. I never catch lives because I live in Australia, upside down land. Wanted to say hello and send love to you all. It's a oh, flat. Man. Thank you. It's a flat disc. Yes. <laughs> Jess, thank you so much. I'm glad that you're able to catch us at this time. It's early over there, I'm sure. But uh, thank you for the love and the support. Gray is 174. How much belief revision would a 6th century manuscript of Daniel with the prophecies cause for you guys? Oh. If it was a six, oh. if you found a 6th century manuscript of Daniel, I suspect sure. with all the prophecies, so the whole book yeah. we have today, let's say, you found it in the 6th century, how much of a oh yeah i mean I, 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 a huge I, difference yeah absolutely but the i mean it, it's important to point out that we don't have anything remotely like yeah that. yeah at like all. all our daniel our, our earliest daniel manuscripts are all from like the like the early first century <laughs> yeah th is, is there one that's like maybe 110 maybe because, yeah yeah and and the the thing the interesting thing about those Daniel manuscripts is, is that if you're paying close attention to them, uh, it sure looks like, um, by the first century BCE, this book of Daniel was still very much in development and flux and was not, there was no, you know, there was, it doesn't look like there was even a settled book of Daniel this late. So much as there were still, you know, lots of Daniel tales and prophecies and and people were, you know, putting various things into different order in different in different kind of collections. It's uh, if anything, you know, the manuscript evidence as it exists now, what what we have just really, really reinforces what scholars have been saying about Daniel for for is it centuries now? At least a century. And wow. just in case anybody's curious, Kip has a bit of a specialization in this area. Mm. Dead Sea Scrolls. You know. You know. Yeah. He's kind of, you know. And it, it made me think of that once again, that I love that scene from Dumb and Dumber. So you're so telling me there's a chance. chance. Yeah. You know, like, come on. 
Conan Lee, thank you for the super chat, Conan. I did not see a comment or question. Oh, oh, you said no question, but to say thank you for the show's time and understanding. Nice one. Thank you. Jess Lee is back again. I just wanted to say I think Dennis Prager might be the Antichrist. <laughs> Laugh out loud. Awesome. Good. We have to do a video now. <laughs> Got to. If people are thinking this, Gray's 174 says, has there been discourse anywhere about the implications of Daniel being a forgery on the validity of Christianity since Jesus called him a prophet? I don't think it makes any, I mean, within, within Chris, I mean, certainly there are, there are huge numbers of very serious, dedicated Christian scholars who recognize uh the the historical reality of the book of daniel and it doesn't it doesn't make a dent and nor should it really because that's not the that's not the foundation of of the claims it doesn't all hinge on that agreed thank you so much appreciate that grace vaguely agnostic thank you guys for the good show just bought volume one and two. Ooh, oh, you wow. want to really you. get a mansion wow. in heaven Keep them coming, Dr. Josh. Good to see you, Dr. Kill. Good to be seen. I really appreciate that. Yeah. You can't go wrong getting the book. And just a quick boom. The new book is out. Go get it right now, hot off the shelf. Let's keep Amazon saying this right here. Yeah. In fact, we can get you a couple number one bestsellers. In the topic of Christian Old Testament criticism, number one bestseller right now. So um, just... Grab you a copy right now, and we'll keep that going. And then Dr. Josh might actually say, you know what? This really is worth coming and uh, giving my time to this useless guy we call Derek from Myth Vision. <laughs> you know? And, uh, <laughs> you know, just, those are the that's the nice way of saying what he's really thinking, you know? So, uh, but seriously, get you a copy. I really appreciate that. Gray's 174 said, is Carrier's Celestial Jesus plausible, compatible with ancient Jewish Old Testament beliefs and Near Eastern cultural beliefs? So I don't know Carrier's argument. So I know a little bit about it. And uh, I mean, any like anything's plausible. Um you can you can develop a compatibility on the on the basis of of uh reading texts uh, within a given context uh, what i will say is it's not it's not especially likely um at all and and i say that because there just isn't there just isn't the the kind of supporting evidence that uh, that, that we might expect to uh, to bolster um, this this celestial Jesus idea. Thank you, thank you for that. Appreciate that super chat, my friend Joseph. Thank you. What's your opinion on Islam's scientific miracles? Have you guys investigated any of that? Praise Allah. I just, it, it, to me, it kind of boils down to, in a sense, not identical, but like what we find in the Bible when you go, oh, see, well, hold on. Um, this actually matches our cosmology. We found out from um, quantum physics or, you know, like there's something we discover and then all of a sudden the Quran already knew that. Uh, and, and so they're, they're anachronistically putting that the Quran knew 1400 years ago science that we just now really discovered and are able to prove. And for me, I think that, I, I, when I look at it closely, no, no, not at all. Thank you for that super chat. Jess Lee, I just want Tovia Singer to call me sweetheart, then I can die in peace. Ha ha. <laughs> Thank you so much. I, you know, I might can make that happen for you, Jess. I, I do have his number, so um, we'll see what we can do here. We'll see what we can do here. Humanist Reformation. Thank you for the super chat. The fact that various people of all religions have divine experiences invalidates anyone using the experience argument for why their God is true. It happens in all religions among some people or all religious among some people. Yeah. Or amen to that. Amen. Constellation Pegasus just about forgot. I'm waiting to see if the James Webb telescope will catch Allah pelting devils with stars. 
That's why they built it, right? Yeah. The secret. I, I have I have to say just like super, super quickly. I remember having a conversation like three years ago after we started doing our, our YouTube channel with uh, like an astronomer, a very high level astronomer. And he was talking about how there was a satellite that had gone up to take pictures like actually out in space in orbit. So it wouldn't be like the pictures wouldn't be uh, distorted at all by the ozone or any of this stuff. And it was getting ready to come back to earth the, like the next day. And so people were delivering all these papers uh, all day because they knew that all their data was going to be outdated uh, as soon as that data came back from the satellite or whatever from the camera. And I said, you know, it's, it's funny to me that so many people think that the earth is flat and there was just silence in the restaurant. And he looked at me and he said, people don't think that. And I said, oh, oh, yeah, they do. Oh, yeah, they do. Uh, so, yeah. Wow. Mm. Mm. Jess Lee, I have to get ready for work. Love you guys. Thank you for your work. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you, Jess. Hope you enjoy your day at work. Scrolling down to make sure I didn't miss anybody here. I just want to wrap Okay, here we are. Tex Gaming, any thoughts on the Sennacherib conquest in Judah? Any thoughts on why he decided to go back to Assyria then go on to destroy Babylon a year of returning? Or a year yeah, after. Yeah, yeah, after. Yeah. So um, you guys weren't involved in that debate, no. even though it was pitched to try. We were going to try and set something yeah. up. But yeah, any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, uh, sorry, Kip, you might have more to say about this. Uh, I haven't I haven't read through the 701 stuff in a while, but um, the the problem with trying to say, in my opinion, anything definitive uh, about unless it's explicitly um, identified in the royal inscription, and even then, right, that, that they may say there's a reason that they did something that is definitely not the reason that they did it. Um, but is that the, the campaigning that's done, particularly by the Assyrians, um, it was part of the theology, right? It was it was part of what what you know made them the followers of Asher that they were. And so doing this annual campaigning out to the West and doing this sort of posturing and having uh, iconography up in their uh, palaces, you know, these reliefs that, that depict all this grotesque violence, like a lot of this stuff is intended to have an effect. So like trying to say, well, the reason that Sennacherib must have done X is this uh, outside of, you know, some, some, some actual positive evidence for that, mm -hmm. um, I think is just on its face incredibly problematic from a historical standpoint. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Mr. Monster says, you guys are the best. And remember, either all gods exist or no god, gods exist. Thank you I for like that. It. Lyle, I hope I'm saying that right. Lyle, Book of Enoch, astronomical, astronomical chapters. Dr. Josh, in your studies, did the cultures you studied talk about the sun traveling through portals? What is this? Um, yeah, I haven't read Enoch in a while. Um, again, it's very late for me mm -hmm. um so the path of travel for the sun in uh mesopotamia for example is you know it, it follows this cosmology right so when the sun goes across the, the dome and comes down it goes down into the netherworld um you have depictions that are interesting uh like in the epic of gilgamesh where gilgamesh has to race through a tunnel to outrun the sun, right? It's because the sun's coming through the tunnel. Like it's, 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 it's not a, I don't think there's a uniform understanding uh, in, in a lot of these cosmological respects, but certainly this idea that the sun made this travel uh, across the sky and then went into the netherworld to come up on the other side. Did you want to make a quick comment on that, Kip? Or No, I'm good. Thank you. M. Doug, is there any way, is it Rakia for the Rakia. Rakia for the firmament could be anything other than solid? I don't see how. Uh, Kip, sorry if you wanted to. No, I, I, I mean, I, I, w I would tend to agree. Um, 
I would say one of the problems with uh, with dealing with ancient languages is that unfortunately they didn't, you know, it'd be great if they had provided us with a lexicon yeah. to show us the semantic ranges of, of all of these words that get used and what, what scholars do um, is painstakingly just, just compile yeah. a list of all the lexemes in all the contexts that they can find. Um, and like rakia is a, is a noun um, based on, you know, various verbal expressions and from, you know, what we see of the verbal expression of this term, the understanding we derive from that is that this is a, this is a solid material, right? But we yeah. can't, I mean, we just don't, we, in the end we're doing, I, you know, scholars are doing their best. And say, you know, this is this is most likely what's going on here, but like I said, because because those thoughtless ancients didn't think to put all their, you know, to to just just write a dictionary. That's what makes Mesopotamia so badass, right? Because they did, right? They yeah. were like, "Here's the Sumerian word. Let me there give you, you all go. the Akkadian equivalents." There you, you know. Go. Um, mm. Yeah, and and I would I would add that a big component to this is looking at other ancient Near Eastern cosmic geographies, right? And looking at yeah, right. it is uh, that people in the ancient Near East, uh, in the ancient Near East thought. And so like when you read through the Enuma Elish, for example, one of the things that Marduk does when he kills Tiamat is take her half of her hide and stretch it out. So like when people like um, uh, who's Hugh Ross, like say that, you know, what it says that Isaiah or Job stretches out the heavens, the it's like a big bang. Miss me with that shit. You that's, know? No, that's it's what the Quran like says. The like, Quran, yeah. yeah, yeah, same stuff. Yeah. yeah. So the 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 point is that when you think about like the Aitana myth in Aitana, uh, there's an eagle that the king Aitana jumps on the back of to get to Anu to get up to heaven, and he flies up and he has to fly through gates. There's six gates that he has to fly through. So you know, like th they believed at, at least in Mesopotamian. Um, and I, and I think it's paralleled very well in, in the Hebrew Bible. They believed in, uh, like, it was made of jasper. It's, like, called out in some places. Um, and so, yeah, I, the fact that you have the heavens stretched out, you have the rakia, which means something that is hammered out thin, like metal. Like, I, I just, I don't see any yeah. way that it could be anything other than solid. There's, I mean, there's there's windows in it. Yes. That's right. So right? skates the, there. Yep. Like that. And here, you know, this this sort of goes back to um like when you let the Bible speak for itself, so many yes. times it does sound like there there's these these things like this is this is something that, that would have been quite troubling to me when I was a yeah. believer. Right? Like why does why why does this sound so if I'm supposed to take this seriously, why does this sound so so weird this is why you know mike winger is going you can't possibly mean that <laughs> right because that's dumb because that's dumb right i think that was derek's way of telling us to be quiet because uh, like, no no i'm <laughs> feeling I'm, I'm, listen, we're giving everybody an altar call here okay <laughs> it's, it's, it's the end we've got them tingling with uh with obviously the message and it's time to get them to have the altar call i just posted for everybody to know to subscribe to Dr. Kip Davis' YouTube channel. Um, all the links are in the description. Also, I put the, the link there for you to go and get the copy of the new book from uh, Dr. Josh. And that book is The Atheist Handbook to the Old Testament, Volume 2. Go get it. Dr. Josh, you want to make a quick comment about the book, why they need to grab that book right now? Yeah, I think if you ever have discussions with um, apologists or fundamentalists, uh, be they at around the dinner table, you know, at Thanksgiving uh, or here online, that's what these books are for. It's to give you the background information so that you can have a, a wide understanding, a broad understanding of just the ancient areas in the Hebrew Bible um, and what those fundamentalist relatives of yours believe about it. Uh, and then specific hot button issues that come up a lot, like the Exodus or the Conquest or you know, uh, plagiarism so that 
you can be armed specifically uh, to be able to address those uh, problems in a meaningful way that's effective. I want and, you, allow... and, and you should absolutely get the hardcover so that you can be armed because you can carry it around with you and you're not going to get any grief from anybody. But, you know, if if somebody does decide to mess with you, you could throw it at them. Thank you. You could probably... It's big enough I'm that with two shit. hands... <laughs> You could, you could probably take someone out with it with a fair bit of ease. So it's it's a it's a safety device. Either way, um, if you buy enough of them, you could probably insulate your home <laughs> with them That's as true. well. I you know I I my, my buddy ultimately went a different way, but I, for a while we were we were having this conversation. He's 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 building a cabin in the woods and. And we, we had this conversation about how many of Josh's books he would have to buy and with the mortar and everything to, buy, you know, it, it's, I, uh, it's structurally sound. I, I definitely want to get your thoughts about the, the contents just a second. Is, is there any way that, uh, that Dr. Kent Hoven might have a comment about the book uh, that might, I mean, look, let's let Kip first talk, see if he'll come out of your basement. Yeah. I'll, I'll go talk to him. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Yeah, Kip, yeah. tell us about that book, though. W why is this such a good book? Why do we need to get it? Why, why this? Well, well, I mean, in in addition to to all all the things I I mentioned, you know, one of one of the things that probably doesn't get enough attention from this, and I mentioned it in in uh, my my blurb, is that this is, you know, you can actually learn stuff about the Bible from this book, too. It's not just a counter-apologetics book or, you know, um, ways to, to, to further alienate you from your, your very religious family. Mm -hmm. um, you can learn stuff about the Bible from this book. It's, it's, like, easy to read, and it presents things in a clear, logical uh, way. And... Uh, that's weird. It says Doctor Josh, but that's not Doctor <clears throat> Josh. No, no. Now, uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I sent him back uh, downstairs to uh, do some work. Uh, they're Dino Adventure Land, uh, but I'm uh, I'm I'm Ken Hoven. I taught high school science 15 years. Uh, so what what can I do for you, gentlemen? I understand you're probably talking about the Bible, and you don't understand it uh, because you don't have the Holy Spirit. Okay. Here to help. Was, <clears throat> yeah, yeah. The, I had a simple question um, because you're a doctor and hmm. you know the Bible better than us. Yeah, that's um, right. <clears throat> what do you think? Did you help with at least the editing process for Dr. Josh? Do you recommend this book? Uh, well, you know, here's what I would say about uh, about Dr. <clears throat> Dr. Uh, Josh is that if you're gonna if you're gonna try to understand what atheists uh, like you say about uh, say about the Bible, if you want to get the wrong idea about what the Bible says, well, this is a great book for you. Okay, so uh, but the problem is that uh, we know that uh, dogs. Uh, never produce non-dogs, uh, and so uh, the you know jo Josh doesn't deal with the seventeen types of evolution uh, that we see uh, it talks about, uh, and, and of course so we know that's a religion, and that's your religion, and that's fine, but we don't want that taught in the public schools. So <clears throat> I guess what I would say, uh, as an endorsement for this book, if you want to learn about the wrong things uh, in the Bible, and <clears throat> compared to what I would tell you, which is uh, that you didn't come from soup, um, uh, that, that, yeah, it's, it's a good book to buy. Okay, but again, it's just a bunch of nonsense because Josh doesn't have the Holy Spirit, neither do you, and you're going to hell. You need to repent. Okay, I'm here to help. <clears throat> yeah, well, um, so uh, you mean, would say get the book. Yeah, <clears throat> maybe get two copies, uh, but you can use them as doorstops. Okay, <clears throat> that's what I do in my bedroom. Uh, I live here in the basement. Okay. I mean, <clears throat> there is a chapter in there about, like, sexual violence. Now, <clears throat> oh, we're not going to talk about that here <clears throat> because, uh, of course, those are all... Uh, you know, fa fabricate. Hey, uh, what's that uh, huge distracting thing over there? <laughs> hey, I, mean, I guess I'll. Uh, hey, I'm, hey, you guys, uh, atheists, probably a bunch of perverts talking about those whale penises. I'm out of here. Oh, uh, it, yeah, it's. I I'm mean, not gonna. I guess if if people are comfortable with the fact that that Josh got his PhD from that diploma mill, Johns Hopkins. That's. I mean, I guess. Yeah. I guess if they can stomach that, it's. Sorry. Yeah, I, you know what? Really, it, it it sucks a little that that Josh actually has to take care of that guy in his house. Like, I know, right? You it's know, a little I, it's a little. Oh, hey, Josh. Oh, oh. Hey. that's so weird. 
I mean, you asked for him. You know, yeah, that's. that's... <laughs> it's, it's like you like being it's a masochist or something. Like that. Oh, you're awesome, man. Um, for that, for that alone, you should go get the book. I mean, the, you know, I love talking with you guys. It's always fun. It's always a treat. Um, go check out the book. Let's keep this a number one seller in our community. And uh, Josh will let me know how that keeps going. We'll, we'll... I definitely will. Thank you. We need to do a follow-up where we're talking about that cosmology stuff. But in that, I'd like to also promote the book, letting our audience know to get it. So any final words from you, gents? No, I just thank you so much. And thank you, everybody in the audience, for, yeah, for watching and for getting the book. I just yeah. really appreciate it. Thank you. Kip? No, just go buy the book, guys. You helped edit the whole thing. so You know that yeah. it's good. You know what I mean? It has to be. Uh, no, but really, there are a lot of scholars that put their eyes on this. Yeah. So, uh, so we wanted to lay that to rest that it doesn't get peer reviewed. So, and you can be one who peer reviews, leaving an Amazon review yourself. Yes. And we look forward to that. Drop a comment in this video. Go check out their YouTube ch channels. Make sure you get the the book. Uh, like this video. Share this out there with one of your friends. And never forget, we are. Myth Vision.